Good morning, Washington. Welcome into Manufacturing Week Live. We're here today at the Museum of Flight, home to the aerospace sector for our state and nation's economy. The very first 727, 737, 787, and 747, the queen of the skies, are right here. Today's theme is all about aerospace and the important role it's played not only in our state's economy, but for that matter, the nation's economy. It is truly a privilege and an honor to be here today. AWB serves as not only the State Chamber of Commerce, but the State's Manufacturing Council with our national partner, the National Association of Manufacturing. And as we talk about the great careers and the great pathways that are here today and will be here in the future, we know that currently there are 250,000 men and women who wake up every day and go to work for a manufacturing company, just like these two fine people right here. Manufacturing is alive and manufacturing is essential to our state's economy. It's going to play an essential role in our recovery and our essential role as we rebound going forward. Today we celebrate the 1,400 companies that are in the aerospace community in every county in our state. And do we have an outstanding lineup for you today of speakers. We have Jay Timmons, the President and CEO of the National Association of Manufacturers. Sharu Jain, a Senior Vice President at Alaska Airlines and Daniele Cagnatale, the CEO of Sekasui Aerospace. We'll also do something really special, and that's announced our most prestigious award for manufacturers in this state, our annual Manufacturing of the Year Award. And we have an outstanding lineup of three amazing companies that competed with 45 others for this award. They are Vaughan Timbers, GM Nameplate, and Hobart Machine Products Incorporated. I want to thank our friends at Primera Blue Cross who helped make the 2020 Manufacturing Tour happen and to bring this live experience to you all across the state and for that matter, all across the country. Primera is investing in over $250 million to improve access to care, combat homelessness, and support programs that address behavioral and mental health issues in our local communities. No matter where you are, like us, Primera is in your corner. So sit back, relax, and get ready to take an inside look at manufacturing. At this time, it's really my privilege to welcome to the set Matt Hayes. Matt is the president and CEO of the Museum of Flight and our guest for today. He's also a general aviation pilot as well. Yeah. Matt, thanks for having us and welcome. Well, thank you, Chris. We really appreciate you having here. It's an honor to host the AWB Manufacturing Week at the Museum of Flight. I want to welcome everybody out there. It's great to be on site today for the sights and the sounds. I wish you could see the view that I had. Like all our other organizations, um, it's been a real difficult time on this roller coaster of 2020. But I'll tell you, I, even on my worst days, I am as exciting, excited and grateful to be a part of this institution as I was when I started as a volunteer over 20 years ago. My job as a volunteer was to assemble and install parts on our B-17 bomber. Now, please know out there that we are indeed open. So I thank you for coming Thursday through Monday. Get your tickets online. Come on by. Be inspired. Um, in order to get open for the public, I do want to thank our staff, our volunteers, the best in the world uh, for, again, being resilient and creative. I can't thank them enough for what they've done. I want to thank AWB, who has also helped us and was a partner in helping us get reopened to the public. Uh, you know, I believe the museum is a perfect place to host a conference like this. Pilots don't make history by themselves. They got to have the planes, they got to have the parts on the shelves, uh, and they have to be ready. Neil Armstrong doesn't walk on the moon. It's 400,000 people in industry that make that happen. So we talk about the people, we talk about the stories. Uh, we shut down this summer and took advantage of that philosophy to redo our World War II gallery. And in that, we're telling tons of untold stories. One is about Marjorie Watson. Marjorie was 16 years old when she was hired by North American Aviation. We have her tools that helped design the air scoop for the, the iconic P-51. And that is a great story for young girls everywhere to understand that they can help do the next thing in this case, defeating Nazi Germany. So come on by Thursday to Monday, learn about Marjorie and others, be inspired, look up our educational programs. In the meantime, Chris, have a great conference. We appreciate you being here. Man, I, I gotta tell you, it's really special to be here because it's not just about the history, but as you said, it's also about the future, right? We've got the future of, of aerospace right around us today, but we also have a high school that's you know, 20 feet from us right here, Raised Back Aviation yeah. High School. What a great way to excite young people about the careers of tomorrow and about the great career pathways they can have in aerospace. Well, we're certainly saving lots of space in our galleries for what you all out there are making today and what the students of tomorrow, they're gonna write the next great stories of aviation and aerospace and we're, we'll be here for them. Well, thanks for welcoming us. We look forward to a great program today. Thanks, Chris. 
Uh, with that said, I'd now like to introduce our next speaker, Bill McSherry. Bill is the Vice President of Government Operations for Boeing Commercial Airlines. Bill has responsibility for commercial airplanes and state local operations in the Northwest and South Carolina. He leads a dynamic team of specialists who manage relationships with elected officials and business leaders, advocating for key issues that are important to business and to Boeing's business objectives. He also works really hard on philanthropic opportunities for Boeing to have ways to connect with the local communities and the employees where they call home. Bill, welcome into Manufacturing Week Live. I only wish that you and I were in person, or more importantly, up in the air on this plane. Hey, Chris, thank you. I hope you can hear me just fine. I, uh, it's great to see you at the Museum of Flight. It's great to see you and Matt together. I feel a little bit like George Costanza in that Seinfeld episode when the two worlds are colliding. But in this case, uh, I'm happy about it. I'm glad to see you both. And just to establish my Manufacturing Week cred, I've got my T-shirt from last year, which I will just set aside. I, I'd love to be wearing it there uh, with you guys, but here we are uh, working remotely. Look, manufacturing is critically important uh, to Washington State, and uh, during a period when so many industries are being severely impacted uh, by the COVID-19 pandemic, it's vital uh, that we all remain connected, informed, and firmly focused on the future. So thanks uh, for putting this event on. As I'm sure everybody knows, aerospace has been hit particularly hard by the COVID-19 pandemic. As travel has slowed dramatically around the globe, our airline customers are confronting an economic crisis of historic proportions. Passenger traffic globally continues to be a fraction of 2019 levels, with international traffic still about 90% below 2019. Our customers' crisis is, of course, also our crisis. As we work to support them and their needs going forward, we expect that demand for wide-body airplanes will be, uh, excuse me, will remain depressed for a few years as traffic slowly recovers to pre-pandemic levels. That lower demand and the accompanying decline in aircraft services has forced us to take some very difficult steps and reduce production in several commercial air programs here at Boeing. Chief among those reductions, of course, is our 787 production, which was at 14 airplanes per month at its peak before the pandemic, and will now fall to six per month in 2021. That dramatic decline, a direct result of the pandemic, forced us to carefully study whether we can efficiently operate two final assembly paint and delivery facilities. There were several key factors in that decision, including that many 787 composite components uh, are only built in our North Charleston facility before being transported to Washington being via the Dreamlifter large cargo freighter. Perhaps most visible of those challenges is the simple fact that the fuselage for our largest 787 model, the 787-10, is constructed in North Charleston and cannot fit in the Dreamlifter. Therefore, the 787-10 can only be built in, in South Carolina. Everett simply faced too many significant costs and logistical challenges if we were to consolidate there. As a result, Boeing reached the strategic conclusion to consolidate 787 final assembly in North Charleston. Look, I recognize this is a disappointment here in Washington State, and I want to emphasize that this decision is purely a response to the challenges we are facing due to the COVID-19 pandemic. We have a bright future in this community. Puget Sound is still the home of our largest number of employees. It will remain the exclusive final assembly site for the 737, 747, 767, 777 airplanes and all of their military derivatives. Our investments in recent years reflect our commitment to this region from the billion dollar 777X Composite Wing Center in Everett to the new Workforce Readiness Center in Auburn, which we were so proud to showcase as part of last year's Manufacturing Week. Those investments aren't subsiding and others continue to flourish, such as our ongoing emphasis on Core Plus, which we'll talk about a little bit later, as well as our charitable investments that continue to grow. Whether they're focused on wildlife, sorry, wildfire relief efforts or social justice or racial equity. We continue to invest in our and our community's future here in Washington. I'm confident that like the aerospace industry, Washington State and our country face a bright future once we bridge these difficult times. Between here and there though, these are challenging days. We're focused on ensuring Boeing and our industry get through this challenge and realize that bright future that we have together. We're looking forward to doing it right here uh, in the state of Washington. Chris, thanks for some time allowing me to join and back to you. Bill, it's great to see you. Great shirt that you have there. 
You know, we, we've done a little bit of an ESPN game day set type of experience this year. I noticed you had a like nice it. scarf with both UW and WSU on it. So, uh, yeah, exactly. great contribution to this. Thank you, Bill, for your support. Thank you for everything you do in our economy and for, for our state of Washington. Thanks, Chris. All right. Take care. Up next, we're going to hear from Jay Timmons, the president and CEO of the National Association of Manufacturers. Before we do so, let's take a quick look at their creator want, Creators Wanted campaign from the NAM. If you're manufacturing an actual good and you have a skill to do that, that's something that will always be needed. People will always need to have something manufactured for them of some real world good. So there's solace in knowing that your career has a future. It's kind of amazing that we get rolls of sheet metal that come off of a trailer and at the end of the line somebody puts a key in and it starts. All of these things have to come together perfectly uh, and it does. The work that I'm doing is right on the cutting edge of innovation in the industry. We're doing new cloud-based service technology, new types of analytics that really haven't been done in the industry before. What I love most is working with the people here. We all have one common goal, and that goal is to make a great vehicle for our customers. There's a lot of beauty in how something is made. I was one of two women in my computer science class of 200, and it felt like I was an outlier. Now, more than half of my team are women. We're all really proud to be women in this career. To think like a digital native, but go into manufacturing and use that skill set, is tremendous. It's in their blood, you know, it's their life to make something. What you're doing actually has an impact on the world. What an inspiring look into what our maker's economy looks like. And joining us now is the president and CEO of the National Association of Manufacturers and a great friend to us at EWB. Jay, welcome in live to our Manufacturing Week tour this year. Thanks, Chris, appreciate it. Um, these things are always fraught with all kinds of issues. As I just mentioned to you during the break, I'm telling my five-year-old to get out of the room. So I apologize for any extra noise. <laughs> <laughs> well, no doubt we've experienced some challenges along our, our tour this year. It is truly awesome to come to you from the home of aerospace for our country and for the state of Washington, the Museum of Flight this morning. Hey, how would you summarize up how our manufacturing sector is doing across the country today? You know, I, I, we've come a long way since those dark days in, in early March. Um, it's no secret manufacturing took a huge hit, but every industry did. And, and, and you represent, of course, the, the broad breadth of uh, the business uh, sector. You saw it everywhere. And we had an unprecedented dip in jobs. We lost about 1.3 million jobs. There was all kinds of confusion as companies tried to figure out orders and uh, shut down orders and safety protocols. But I, I really think that manufacturing has now found its footing. Demand is starting to grow. It's starting to come back. Businesses are hiring. We've, uh, we've recovered about half of those 1.3 million jobs. Um, but you know we still have a long way to go. Um, if we... Uh, uh, it, 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 frankly, we need to get some certainty back. Um, ways to do that are, um, it's not too hard to figure out how to fix the economy, actually. It's by all of us practicing the right safety measures. Uh, but we're so proud of, of what manufacturers did do during the crisis. Our theme that we keep coming back to is that manufacturers are made for this. And many of the folks that I know uh, who are watching this today um, experienced what it was like to work even longer hours to adjust to adjust to new safety precautions. Teams truly dropped everything to help in the fight against COVID-19, going from building things like planes uh, to creating much needed personal protective equipment such as masks and face shields. Uh, some were even called to airlift PPE to states and cities in need. We were working very closely with FEMA uh, to make sure that we could get supplies to the, to the hot zones around the country. So the folks on this call really proved to be an indispensable part of the country's crisis response. And manufacturers are now safely and slowly opening again for business and uh, helping to keep our country up and running. Yeah, Jay, when we talk about the airlift, so proud of the work that Boeing did to bring important PPE uh, all over this country. And so hats off to the team at Boeing. You and know, if all you, the world. That's right, that's right. If you were, could see what I could see, Jay, which is 20 feet away from me, is this three-story high school called Raiseback Aviation. It's, I mean, 
if I could golf worth a darn, I could hit it with a golf ball. And it's connected to the Museum of Flight where they connect STEM education together. So great. So let's think about this Creators Wanted camp, uh, campaign and video that we just saw that it's supposed to excite young people about these amazing careers in manufacturing. Tell us about why this is so important. Well, you know, um, here's a really strange paradox. We have 650,000 jobs we haven't yet recovered from the depth of the, of the recession and the pandemic, yet, ironically, we have 460,000 jobs that are open in manufacturing today that we can't fill. And it's because folks don't have the, the skills that we need for these new high-tech jobs in modern manufacturing. So uh, you mentioned Creators Wanted. Um, Creators Wanted was kicked off earlier this year. Uh, we put it on hold because it did, uh, it did involve being uh, present in communities all across the country with a hands-on experience. It's a multi-million dollar campaign and the goal is to inspire more young people to join our industry. As soon as we can create a vaccine and as soon as we can get this pandemic behind us, we're going to be out in communities all over the country to help inspire that, that next generation. Um, I, I think, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm excited about the number of young people that have participated in our manufacturing day events, many of which, or all of which actually, were virtually this year. Um, and we've seen over the years that the Manufacturing Institute with these Manufacturing Day events has, has been able to energize young people and get them focused on modern manufacturing and the high-tech industry that it is. And, and, and where you are right now, I think is a great example. Aerospace is a great example of, of a high-tech industry. And, and uh, I think we have an even more exciting story to tell after all the work that was done in the pandemic. So. Thanks to everyone who participated in MFG Day and, and Manufacturing Month. Um, and I know some who are working at Boeing were involved in the virtual tours that I mentioned. And we really appreciate that because it's a great way to reach a huge audience. Jay, I've got about two minutes and two questions here. So I'm gonna go fast here. Uh, there's a lot Congress could do to help manufacturers in this country. What would, what's the top two or three things that our listeners should know about what Congress can do? Well, look, we need to get we need to get this next uh, relief bill passed. Uh, we need to extend. This is particularly true for the supply chain and small manufacturers. We need to get the PPP program extended so that folks can apply again for these loans, and then also make sure that um, they can use these loans after December 31st. And we also need liability, very targeted liability reforms for employers who are doing the right things. Jay. Uh... This is a this event's a point of pride for us. This is I'm setting you up here, by the way, just so you know this question that's coming. Do any of our other state chamber, state manufacturer partners deliver a manufacturing week like this, or are we the best out there? <laughs> you know you're the best, or you wouldn't have said that, Chris. But I have to tell you, um, look, what you do is phenomenal. And I remember uh, that first year when you and I were together in the state legislature during a during a manufacturing, uh, state of manufacturing tour, and then you took this manufacturing uh, tour on the road. And it's impactful because we have to inspire that next generation. The news that was just shared is, is obviously very difficult news to hear, but it doesn't mean that you're not creating more and more manufacturing jobs in Washington state. You, if, if you keep focusing on the right policies and you're inspiring that next generation, Washington is going to continue to thrive. It's because of leaders like you that have been able to, to really inspire that next generation. So I thank you for, for doing such a great job out there. And hey, if you want to share some tips with your colleagues in the other states, uh, when you come in as the chair of the, of the Council of State Manufacturing Associations, you'll have a nationwide platform, Chris. You can share those ideas. I appreciate that, Jay. Uh, in a serious note, we've heard from some great students along this this journey that we've been on this last week about why they're so excited to go into work for manufacturing. We're going to hear one from Raise Back Aviation here in a little bit about their excitement. And when you hear his story, I think we all walk away impressed knowing that we've got a great future ahead of us. So uh, President and CEO of the National Association of Manufacturers, Jay. Jay, thanks for joining us today. It's great to be here. Thanks, Chris. All right. We're just getting started, folks. And I'd like to take a moment to thank our other sponsors for making the 2020 manufacturing tour happen. That's Primera Blue Cross, Walmart, Boeing, UPS, and many more. Now it's a time to take a deep dive into this important aerospace sector and look at the frontier of what lies ahead. Joining me here on set is Emily Whitman, President and CEO and 
brand ambassador for <laughs> aerospace in our state. Emily was appointed CEO in 2019. She leads the Alliance work to serve as an advocate for the important sector we call aerospace. And joining us virtually, fellow Montana, by the way, we have Deloitte Wolf, uh, who leads Impact Washington. He's the president and CEO of that group. Emily, Deloitte, welcome on in. Good morning, thank you. Hey, welcome everybody. Well, Thanks, you know, let's get started with the big picture here. Aerospace is a huge driver of our economy, uh, not only for Washington State, but for the entire country. Aerospace and defense generated just under a trillion dollars of goods and sales in 2018. And of course, there's much more that, of that that came from this state of Washington. So Emily, let's start with you. Uh, how would you summarize the aerospace industry today and the challenges and opportunities that lie ahead in the horizon? Thanks, Chris. It's honestly the same way I would have characterized it if it was 2019, 2018, 2000, 1990 creative, innovative, and most importantly, resilient. We have faced many different market forces that have impacted all of our lives in the past, and aerospace seems to be on the forefront of that always. You know, I keep saying and, and joking, uh, maybe cathartically, that the aerospace industry seems to have been living 2020 longer than 2020 has existed. <laughs> you know, we have had the 737 Maxes, and of course, we have many of them behind us down here, uh, Boeing Field and Renton. Um, but we are resilient. I don't want to sugarcoat it too much. Our companies are really struggling. They're struggling because they've had rates cut, which they understand market demand has changed. Uh, and then of course they had to figure out how to safely produce uh, and, and stick by their workers you know, on the front lines. Our aerospace workers were deemed essential almost right away. And so we have been really creative. And we're also some of the first response to the COVID resilient crisis. We are involved in medical device manufacturing. We have GM Nameplate, one of your nominees, was building uh, face shields and other protective gear. I can't tell you the number of companies that just didn't have gloves for their workers to be in their clean rooms, for example, because they boxed them up and they took them over to their local nursing home, you know, day one of the of the crisis. And so we are creative, we are resilient, and we're also uh, really excited to be in our space industry here. We have been doing space work since the Boeing uh, Space Center in Kent in the 60s, right? So we have this long history of being involved in many different facets of our market outside of just commercial. Uh, we're also hopeful that commercial will come back, and we are really excited to uh, be part of that supply chain once again. What a rich history in our state. You were talking about innovation. Delay, I want to come to you. What are you seeing being done in the innovative front by aerospace manufacturers? Yeah, I think uh, one of the things that's really helped a lot in aerospace is uh, during the downturn, I think that a lot of companies have taken advantage of our no-cost assessment, and we're really taking a look at their business holistically, Chris. And what we're looking at, we're looking at how do we retool? What else do you have in your supply chain that we can leverage to do other things? And I, you know, as you, we've seen, some of our companies have done PPEs for the state. And so we're saying that some other people have said, hey, let's get our DOD CMM cybersecurity so we can be in the supply chain for defense, as you mentioned early on. So we're seeing a lot of that kind of work. And, to date, we've actually uh, completed about 75 of those retooling assessments with, with manufacturers in our state, and we've committed over $600,000 for consulting work to help them do innovation and remake them, themselves out there. And it's part of the $1.2 million of the CARES fund that the NIST MAP got from the state of Washington. So we're seeing a lot of really exciting things like that going on. I'd like to ask each of you, if you had a message for policymakers about what they could do to support this important aerospace industry, what could that be? And maybe Deloitte, maybe I'll come to you first. Uh, if you had a message, what would that be for uh, leaders to hear in our state? I think it's really, really important that we leverage our talent in this state and we need to provide workforce training dollars to retrain, retool and re-upskill our current workforce and look at different opportunities, whether it's in robotics or whether it's in uh, software, code work. Um, I think there's a lot of things we can explore. So I would really ask that we have a really open view and leverage those talented work people we have in our state. Thanks, Deloitte. Emily? Thanks, Chris. I'm so glad that Deloitte mentioned our talent. It's critically important that we continue to inspire the next generation. But that next generation also fundamentally needs a place to work in aerospace. And so my message for our leaders, whether it is Congress or governor or our legislature is 
please do not make it any more difficult for our aerospace companies to survive. That is the mode that we've been in 2020, is survival. So we can't have any more increases in our tax rate. We can't say goodbye to any of our aerospace preferences uh, because those are the ones that are keeping our doors open. We critically need more assistance from the federal government and from Congress. We do need a package passed. Um, we also need supportive policies and something like the 737 uh, regulation with the FAA, you know, doesn't make it easier to do aerospace business across the entire country of the US, let alone if it's here or on the other coast. So I would say that we are trying as hard as we can to be creative and innovative and resilient and we need our policymakers help to survive this year. We understand that there are revenue conversations that need to happen. Would love to have those in a 2021 or 2022 market where we are back on our feet. We've got about a minute left. Mm -hmm. Deloitte, any you know, closing comments and thoughts about aerospace in the state of Washington? I, I just want to echo what Emily and everybody downstream are going to probably talk about. We have to leverage our workforce, our talent, and we have to make sure that we are continue to be the best aerospace state in the country and and we will hold that up against anybody moving forward so uh, thanks for having us and we look forward to doing more work with awb and with afa and uh, commerce on aerospace work thanks thank you to Light, emily closing thoughts yeah, if you want to hear more about what we've talked about today, AFA Summit is next Wednesday, October 14th. It is all virtual and we have next to normal networking. It's really exciting. We're using a great platform. Please come and sign up for it. You're welcome to email me directly uh, if you would like to attend. But we are going to be talking about these issues and more at that summit next Wednesday. Thanks, Website Chris. is what? www.afa-wa.com. All right, folks, there we heard it. Deloitte, thank you for joining us. Emily, the brand ambassador for aerospace in thank our state. You, Thanks for being with us today. Thanks, everybody. Good job, Chris. One of the themes I want to highlight today is the overall strength of this great aerospace sector. In 2018, the industry generated $71 billion in gross revenue for our state, and there were more than 83,000 workers. The total compensation in this sector was over $12 billion. Yes, you heard me right, $12 billion with a B. Aerospace continues to be a major pillar of our manufacturing economy here in Washington. And here to help us continue this conversation is Robin Toth. She's the governor's sector lead for aerospace at the Department of Commerce. And on set today, I'm being joined by the president and CEO of Sekasui Aerospace, Daniele Cagnatale. Daniele joined Sekasui in 2017 and prior to that, served in a number of operational roles at JKN Aerospace and most recently as their president and CEO of Aerostructures North America. I want to welcome both of you into the set. I wish Robin you were on set today and could join us live, but it's great to see you via Zoom. You've properly got some great aerospace pictures behind you there as well. And so, and Daniele, who serves on the AWB Board of Directors, it's great to have him on set with us as well. Robin, can you hear me? I can, can you hear me? Okay. I can. Uh, let's go to you first and talk about, you know, you know, what's been the magnitude of the COVID-19 on this sector of our economy and our ability uh, to get to air transport? It's been absolutely devastating on the aerospace industry. Like many of you, I used to travel a couple, at least a couple times a week and at a minimum, sometimes more. Our planes and our airports were busier than ever with significant increases since 2017. But in March 2020, we'll all remember how the uh, air travel crashed, which is not a good analogy, but um, by 94%, while total flights were down by about 70%. And here's another reality check. During the first months of the crisis, when airplanes were flying, there were only 17 passengers on each domestic flight and 29 passengers on international flights. So in April, when Congress decided to help fund the uh, airline industry, that was a real boom for the industry, helping them with um, additional funding to get through this crisis. Recently, we learned from Airlines for America that they don't think it'll fully rebound until 2024 when air travel returns to passenger numbers we saw earlier this year. 
And the airlines are still in survival mode and really need some additional investments um, to help them get through 2020 and 2021. And the restart is going to be difficult for airlines because a lot of the cost was borne by um, first class passengers as opposed to regular um, passengers and the passenger numbers aren't going to be enough to generate profit. And until business travel recovers, um, there's likely going to be less of that in the future. And you really do depend on that to help with uh, the cost of flights. So passenger volumes are still down by about 70% and 29% of seats are still empty. We're looking at how, you know, how are you gonna make air travel safer in the future? Um, and we know that a lot of viruses and germs do not survive on flight because of how the air circulates on airplanes. In fact, the air uh, quality in airplanes is about as good as in a hospital room because of the HEPA filtration. So we realize that many people are so concerned about social distancing, which is going to be different on flights, um, sitting within six feet of other people or even closer. So airlines are now conducting um, additional cleaning measures and requiring a lot of passengers, almost all passengers, to wear facial coverings to restore consumer confidence in air travel. And certain requirements have been implemented for travelers, including quarantines and uh, mandatory testing. So in a recent survey, we learned that less than half of the respondents stated that they weren't sure when they wanted to return to flight. Hopefully, government is going to help us with some additional funding to help uh, get us through the next few months, next year or so. And so that's kind of the place where we find us ourselves in right now. Thank you, Robin. Daniele, let me go to you. By the way, you look great in a suit and tie. I think you might be the first suit and tie I've seen in person in maybe six or seven months. It's also the first time I've worn it in six <laughs> or seven months, to tell you the truth. I thought, what a great opportunity. Indeed. Uh, I'd have the problem of, I hope it fits, I hope it fits uh, for me, and, and my pants did today. Hey, you, you run an aerospace company here in the state of Washington. Tell us kind of the challenges you're facing. What can policymakers do to be helpful to you as you think about the future of your company and the future of aerospace here? Well, uh, I can tell you, obviously, it's very, very challenging times. I mean, clearly the reduction in air travel has got an immediate impact on the deliveries of aircraft and people like us delivering to Boeing and to Airbus are hugely affected. I mean, to give you a feel, uh, we had to unfortunately reduce our staff by 40% to right size our business to this phase. Now, uh, having said that, in terms of legislature, I think that the key issue at the end of the day, at the center of this debate, is the coronavirus pandemic. And anything that we are looking to do in the future is going to be strictly driven by that. When people have more confidence in flight, uh, when we have more of a handle on the virus, we will be able to see a return to passenger flight, which in turn means more employment for us. So on that front, you know, I really have to say, I would really like to commend Governor Inslee and his administration for what they've done in the state of Washington, because the pragmatic approach to protect the people here from the coronavirus has really helped, and it's really helped in business. And it's allowed us in the AWB also to be able to put the right uh, committees in place and the right forums to help businesses to reopen safely. And I think the state of Washington truly has been an example to follow across many other states. So as we move forward, you know the one wish that I have as a business leader, if we manage to make the technology leap to provide testing and quick results for testing across the board for businesses, I think between now and the time a vaccine is actually deployed, is going to be the, very much the solution for us to contain the virus and regain customer confidence in flight and for us to regain employments on the job. You mentioned one of those efforts that we started at AWB as a rebound and recovery task force and an important role around that was, was PPE. Things like face masks, scans, hand sanitizers, etc. You guys did some work in this space early on as well. Can you share just a few minutes about that? Yeah, absolutely. You know, we have the fortune of the similar uh, production processes as to make PPE. So what I, we did and what our employees stepped forward to do whilst we are shut down the business is to go into the business and manufacture masks, manufactured 
uh, gloves manufacture uh, materials that allows the production of PPE for the local community and not just for businesses but also for hospitals and for children and it was very heartwarming to see what was not just a business decision but it was actually the employees saying we want to do more we want to help and you know we manufacture around 40,000 masks for the local community and it's been a great exercise and a great way for us to have an opportunity to contribute in these very difficult times. So your employees sounds like felt really proud of what they did on the PPE front and the difference that they can make in their communities. Absolutely. Oh, that's, that's really cool. Robin, let's go back to you. We got about 30 seconds apiece for each of you. Uh, advice for policymakers as we think about this important sector and going into the next legislative session? We're going to continue to need additional investments, and I know that our federal delegation is really looking at that. It's going to do a tremendous amount to help the airline industry, and we don't know how they're going to rebound from COVID, but we hope that our partners in our delegation will help us with um, finding the resources for that. Thanks, Robin. Danielle, any thoughts for you? I think as we move forward, even I'm thinking about past the pandemic, there's going to be a few years before air travel really rebounds. And one of the things that we can invest in the state, how do we connect high technology jobs with the digital infrastructure and the media infrastructure that we have in the state of Washington to manufacturing? There's still a huge disconnect between digital technology that we enjoy in every world and aerospace manufacturing. Spending now the time to invest in training spending now the time to invest in the infrastructure that joins those two together to make us make a technology leap in the service of aerospace uh, processes in a digital way that you know competing countries may not have yet. Robin, thank you for being with us today virtually. We hope we get to do it in person soon. Daniele, thank you for your thank leadership. You, Hats off to your employees for making important PPE. It's, uh, it's an acronym we didn't know six months ago. It's going to be here for a while. Did. They look right. beautiful as well, look at that. Oh, that is looks good. All Those right. made by employees. Thank you very much. Thank Great you. to see you both. Cheers. All right, everyone. Thank you for joining us so far. One of the, over the course of this week's show, what we've seen is innovation and technology being at the forefront of so much manufacturing. One of those is 3D mapping. 3D mapping is just one innovation that's now available to manufacturers and employers across our state. Now we're going to get to know Dassault Systems, a world leader in 3D design and engineering software. Let's take a look at this introductory video and learn more. As we go through engineering revolutions, collaboration and automation of multidisciplinary design becomes increasingly crucial. Integrating disparate tools, organizations, and processes enables you to develop innovative products with confidence. Co-design revolutionary aerospace programs on time, on target, on specification. By virtually collaborating in the design phase, any change can be caught early in the process to lower costs, reduce design time, and schedule impacts downstream. When programs stay on track, you can spend more time on innovation, improve quality ramp up, and minimize risks, all while lowering upfront costs. Get ready to innovate with agility. Learn more about the processes in your solution. And here to help us learn more is Jessica Kinnan, a Senior Aerospace and Defense Industry Solutions Manager with the company. Good morning. Hello, Chris. Thanks for being here. Tell us a little bit more about your company and about 3D mapping. Yeah, uh, so I work for Dassault Systems. Uh, we're a worldwide company supporting over 200,000 different enterprise customers. Uh, we focus on software, is kind of what a lot of people mm -hmm. know us for. With that comes many decades of experience with a lot of our experts uh, coming in. We have an end-to-end -end solution. Uh, in 2000, um, back in 1980, they were kind of one of the first companies to really come out with that CAD solution. And over that time frame, we've definitely grown. We've seen a lot of challenges manufacturers and companies have had integrating um, the ideas, the requirements, down to engineering, down to manufacturing. So we heavily invest in our research and development. Around 2008, we came out with kind of a, a new innovative product, which was the idea of the 3D experience platform, 
which has kind of a core data model that can be used by all organizations between all processes from a beginning to end perspective. So that's really where we've put a lot of focus on really just integrating the businesses and companies with both their customers, um, the products, and then anything you know that's kind of grown from there. So if I'm a manufacturer and they're listening in today, what should they best know about what this technology, what this can do to help their company? So what's really great about this, traditionally if you look at a lot of the systems, it's a spider web. It's you have separate systems, data is segregated, uh, you'll have certain people in one system that don't have permissions in the other systems. So what this allows to do is have a base platform, um, similar to like Google did. When Google came out and you log in with your Google account, yep. you now have access to your calendar, to your email, and you have it broken down into a process perspective not necessarily a system perspective. So when I want to email, I click on my app. If I want to go into my calendar, I click in it. And when I add stuff to my calendar, it, it's then used in the other apps, right? Mm -hmm. So reuse of data, ease of data, and looking at it from the process perspective. We did this with basically engineering and manufacturing. Depending on the process that the user needs to use, they don't have to log in and out anymore. They don't have to always import and export data. Um, there's a base set of data that you find on the 3D Experience platform. And then depending on what you do, you select the app that any role would need to use that, and then they log in that way. So it really simplifies that overarching architecture of systems, it simplifies this process, um, it allows reuse, um, it improves collaboration. So when we have engineers and manufacturing in the same area, they can add each little bit that each of them do and then they can review that with all organizations. And, and you've done a lot of projects already in the state with this, correct? Yes, we have several customers here. Um, Electro Impact, I guess, is very heavily involved around here and they like to showcase a lot of stuff. Uh, we're branching out more. Um, not only do we do aerospace manufacturers, uh, but we also do, we cover all 12 industries. Um, Aerojet's another one here that we've started getting in and helping lean out their systems recently. Um, airlines is an area we're working into. So think from an aerospace perspective, you have the requirements down in the beginning, but you always want to plan for maintenance, for operating, for service. So by allowing um, a collaboration between airlines, how can we kind of bring that data back in and make maintenance easier down line? It also goes into airlines like what we have here at SeaTac. Um, simulation is a big topic, right? When I first say simulation, you know, what are your thoughts? Most people are <laughs> fighting simulations. No. Um, a lot of people go straight to engineering simulation. Simulation not only can be used for engineering how the product works, but also how we manufacture. We can look at simulating within the building. We had a lot of COVID cases come up where you can actually simulate where the employees are. Can you maintain that six feet guidelines before we even put anyone at risk or before we look at anything? Um, reduction or increase or decrease in rates, you can simulate that as well. And like I said, that can be used for any type of manufacturer. It can be used in airlines. It can be used on the product. So it's something that could definitely be reused. I have like 20 more questions and three, <laughs> three less minutes to go to. So Jessica, I want to thank you for joining mm -hmm. us uh, today. If someone wants to reach you, how would they best do that? Um, they're definitely willing to reach out on LinkedIn. I'll okay. take some of that. Um, AWB, Paulette has me. They know who, who I am. Um, we'll also be our women in manufacturing conferences coming up. Yeah. So Dassault is a sponsor there. Um, I also head the board there. So I think we've had a few of our women in this week that are really excited about that. So yeah. We're we have, and I want to thank you because we've had a chance to spend some time with some of them. There's some impressive mm -hmm. leadership there. Thank you for joining us. We appreciate you being here today. Of course. Now we're going to take a short commercial break, but stay with us. Alaska Airlines is up next, including a discussion with lawmakers. And after the break, we'll look at the Manufacturing Week 2020 in more general. Thank you for joining us. Enjoy this short break. Primera Blue Cross is in your corner, wherever it may be. We're there for you at the corner of hustle and bustle, providing health plans for the most innovative companies in a region that's booming. We're also in the corners of places that aren't measured by size to ensure rural communities are well cared for too. We're in your corner for the bumps in the road and the long roads ahead. 
partnering with Seattle Cancer Care Alliance to have Primera people on site. We're in your corner the exact moment you need us. And when a whole community is in need, investing millions to fund mental health services and fight teenage homelessness. Primera is in these corners. These corners. And these corners. Every day, working hard to make healthcare work better. We're Primera Blue Cross. And we're always in your corner. My name is Jerick Liam. My name is Matthew Oaks. My name is Emily Blundred. Maya Wilson. It's Ethan Olson. Some of the machines I've personally worked on are autoclaves. I do a lot of uh, predictive maintenance work, making sure that the machines are in top shape 100% of the time. I didn't know that this place, the developmental center, mostly did composites, but that's like the main thing they do here, so it's a really good place for me. I'm a stronger learner by touching something and figuring it out myself. I'm sure employers would be happy to see that I, I have been trained, I do have experience. I talked to my manager about what I wanted to do, which is become a mechanical engineer, and based off of that, he's let me talk to other engineers that work at this facility and get to kind of shadow them as well, as well as the mechanics and electricians. So I've gotten to see both sides of not only how people fix things, but how people design things as well. Some of these employees have been here for 35 years and they know everything there is to know and they can teach you really quickly exactly what you need to do and how to do it. While I am an electronics technician, I am able to work on the water jet and uh, learn about the autoclaves and do some repairs on different machines. I definitely recommend applying even if you're not sure and I recommend taking classes like Core Plus and different shop related classes in high school. And this is this is really valuable experience because I can find out what I really enjoy doing. I've been able to uh, get a lot of experience in electrical, mechanical, and hydraulic skills. I'm very glad and relieved that I'm able to be here. I think with the, such a broad overview of different skills that I learn, um, this internship is priceless. So I feel like I'm one of the lucky ones. Welcome back to the Museum of Flight. This next segment's around workforce, and you may see two people, they look like they're, they're not moving, but they look like they're heading to that Boeing 747 to go fly the airplane here. Only appropriate that we talk about workforce and the great opportunities that lie ahead in STEM education. And I see a high school that's 25 feet here in front of me called Breezeback Aviation. I'm joined on set today by Dana Riley Black, the Vice President of Education for the Museum of Flight, and virtually, by Michelle Burrison, a Senior Manager for Workforce Development with Boeing, and Mary Kay Bredesen, Executive Director for Center for Excellence in Aerospace at Everett Community College. Welcome on in everybody, we're glad to have you here. Thank you. Mary Kay, I'm gonna start with you if we can. Can you, can you share with us, uh, are we doing enough at the state level to support STEM in our schools and wh where do you think we stack up in that effort and that, that workforce? Well, thank you, Chris, and thank you so much for including the Center of Excellence for Aerospace and Advanced Manufacturing in your week-long appreciation for manufacturing in our state. Uh, your question is a great one, and it's one that we are asked about frequently. I do believe that our state is doing a great job at integrating and exposing our students to STEM education. Uh, elementary, middle, and high schools are providing many STEM programs like FIRST Robotics, Project Lead the Way, Core Plus, and many other programs that are integrating our learning in science, technology, engineering, and math. We are actively engaging our young girls to pursue career pathways in engineering, aerospace, advanced manufacturing, space exploration, and IT. The middle schools and the high schools, they've created marvelous programs that intertwine the STEM disciplines uh, with robotics, avionics, mechatronics, and other disciplines that develop the awareness and the skill sets that our industry partners are telling us that they so desperately need for the workforce. But, you know, we also need to recognize that we want to stay ahead of the curve. What I think we really need to be prepared for and focus on are the STEM jobs and opportunities that will exist in the next five years, 10 years. The global economy will be even more competitive, more automated, more technology driven than it is today. So computing will be faster, cheaper, 
Quantum computing and digitalization are already here. It is vitally important that education keep pace with the rapid advancement of this technology. And that means that we need to have the resources to adapt. For us in aerospace and aviation training programs, we are preparing for the future. We're laying the groundwork now for urban mobility, unmanned systems, and space exploration. But it's our responsibility that these programs are accessible to every single student within Washington State so that we are providing the workforce of the future with a talent pool that embraces diversity, inclusion, and equity. Thank you, Mary Kay. Michelle, let's turn to you. Core Plus has truly been a great success for our state and a great success for students. Can you share a little bit about that program? Yeah, thanks, Chris. Uh, first, just I appreciate the question and also the invitation to participate on today's panel. Core Plus Aerospace, as you said, has been a great success. Thanks to Boeing's initial investment, nearly a million dollars in curriculum development and continued resource investment in building awareness around the Core Plus Aerospace programs, we have over 3,000 students who have gotten the chance across Washington State to build industry-backed hands-on skills. That prepares them for a wide variety of options, whether it's a manufacturing career, the military, or continued upskilling in college. And as with everything, there are areas we can continue to improve and invest. Michelle, it's connecting really great with students, but it's also connecting with families, right? We, we hear parents getting more excited about this program and the role that it can play for their children, correct? Yeah, definitely. So many students and families are telling us that they understand this career path and appreciate that Core Plus Aerospace gives students both an opportunity to explore advanced manufacturing and get a head start on the path up to their career. We've seen that in public opinion data this past spring. Nearly three quarters of Washingtonians said that they want to expand Core Plus Aerospace to more schools across the state and seven in 10 parents said they want their children to consider taking four plus aerospace classes. So the interest and demand is there. We've seen that play out in enrollment across the 40 partner schools. Over 1200 of the students I mentioned before had the opportunity to participate in core plus aerospace just last year. And those students definitely love the program. So key focus for us is to continue to build that awareness of Core Plus among school administrators and parents, really equipping them with the information they need to best support the students who are looking for increasing their options after high school um, through those applied learning opportunities. And then during this challenging time of remote learning, Boeing along with our partners, including CTE teachers, are really working hard to drive virtual content into the learning environment any way we can. Thanks, Michelle. Dana, can we talk about the important efforts you're doing to connect students with STEM education? Absolutely, um, and thanks for being here all day long at the Museum of Flight. As, as a school district administrator now at the Museum of Flight, I think it's really important for our educational systems to really think about not only academic fluency, but career fluency. And that's often left out um, in, our, in our educational pathways. And career fluency is something that begins not in high school, and, and it was alluded to by our colleagues already, but also um, but way back further up in the educational pipeline. There's research that shows that interest, and we've known this for a while, interest in STEM careers starts to toggle off, toggle off actually by middle school. And aspiration, that's when you can conceive yourself in a career opportunity, starts to toggle off in late elementary school. So we've got to do our diligence earlier on in the, in the grade levels. And to be able to foster that type of career fluency, we need to develop, if you will, continuum of experiences for our students. Here at the Museum of Flight, we really focus on three pathways, flight, space, and engineering. And we develop our programs around a continuum that includes inspiration, exploration, and then preparation. In, um, inspiration would be those broad experiences like a field trip, like a planetarium experience. Exploration is when you have opportunity to spend more time, go in more depth, and gain more excitement and passion, say a camp program. And then preparation is when you are actually having those preparatory experiences that lend to a certification program or college 
college credits. And we have programs like that with our private pilot and our um, aeronautical um, science pathways programs. We're gonna run out of time here. I'm already being told this, but Dana, if somebody was interested about uh, learning more about your programs, they would go where to find that information? Great question. Um, our traditional programs are, of course, listed on our website, and we currently are revamping as many of our programs as possible to take place in a remote experience, both by mail and online. Let me go, Michelle, to you. If someone was interested in Core Plus, wanted to know more about it, where would they go to find more information on Core Plus? Sure, easy. We just have a website, www.coreplusaerospace.org. It's a great uh, opportunity to get both resources and to get your questions answered. Dana, Michelle, Mary Kay, thank you all for joining us. This went by way fast. I would like to have another half hour if we could and talk about the careers of tomorrow with each of you. Thank you for your leadership that you're doing to excite young people. Yeah, thank you, Chris. Thank you. Thanks. Now before our next segment, actually that's not correct. Now we're gonna take a quick look at some of the crucial connections between formal education and landing a job in the private sector. I'm gonna be joined on set by Teresa, Tri Teresa Tipton, principal of Raiseback Aviation High School, which I can see like right here, I can throw something and hit with. And via Zoom, we have Max Walliver, a senior at Raiseback Aviation High School. And we're also joined via Zoom by Tom Brosias, vice president and general manager of Orion Industries. For our Raiseback Aviation team, we had a chance to stop here. I believe it was just two years ago as part of our AWB Manu Manufacturing Week tour. And I have a great white dress shirt that has the Raiseback Aviation High School, uh, Max, hanging in my closet at home. So everybody, welcome on in to today. Tom, I'm gonna go to you first. Uh, let's talk about what are some of the best ways students can make those important connections between interest in something and then landing a real job, if you would. Well, Chris, thanks for having us on and it's an important subject. I think most students and frankly anybody who's making a career change stumbles at the first step. Um, the, uh, the best tool, the most powerful tool we all have uh, for starting a job, starting a career is the people we know, it's networking. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, the goal for, for a student should be to be making connections uh, with people who are in the industry, in the careers that you have an interest in. Uh, you have targets all around you, uh, the teachers, the guest speakers maybe that you had in, in classes are all um, uh, super targets uh, for starting that. Friends and family, neighbors even, uh, may have connections. There's not many degrees of separation uh, between an interest you have and somebody who is currently uh, exercising that interest. So uh, networking is, is uh, the big deal. Another way to gain connections in that uh, field is through the professional organizations that are out there. We just had Emily on from AFA, and uh, AFA is a super uh, organization uh, if you want to get into the uh, aerospace industry. Uh, PNAA, uh, the Pacific Northwest Aerospace Alliance, is also uh, another super um, organization to uh, help students and other people entering a uh, field uh, make those connections. Uh, they all have uh, student-focused events and, and uh, are very welcoming to people trying to uh, uh, engage in, in that industry. The last thing, and we just had a uh, <clears throat> we just had a, 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 a advertisement for internships. Internships are um, a uh, excellent entry, first entry into a field that you're interested in because it gives you mentorship and it gives you experience. Uh, that you can use then for a resume for a permanent position, sometimes with the same company. That's what I would recommend uh, for somebody who's trying to go that path. Thanks, Tom. Let me bring in the principal, <laughs> principal of Raceback Aviation. One of the important opportunities is to get the employer sector into the, into the buildings, uh, working with programs and getting exposed to great students like Max. Talk to us about how that happens. Well, that is a really great question because uh, Tom just alluded to some of the things that we do at Raceback Aviation High School, and it really is truly about making those connections, making the opportunities, and taking advantage of um, the partnerships between local industry and um, high school students. Um, we know that there's a variety of ways to do that. Uh, Tom mentioned internships. 
We have a very robust internship program at Raysbeck Aviation High School, and I wish it could be duplicated you know, across the nation. Uh, we have uh, Blue Origin, Boeing, Alaska, the Port of Seattle, um, and many smaller companies, and the value and transformation in our students' lives by um, doing an internship over the summer, um, it just makes a huge difference in their employee trajectory for years to come. In fact, we have students frequently invited back and even offered positions with some of these companies because they took advantage of the internship. Uh, mentors are also a huge um, opportunity for employers to connect with schools. We have over a hundred mentors for our students. Uh, they do everything from casual conversations to helping them write resumes and again valuing what those job skills are for whatever the student is passionate about in their future. Um, at the school, again, Tom mentioned guest speakers. We have, uh, we pride ourselves again on providing opportunities for students um, with project-based learning, that hands-on meaningful opportunities for students. Um, every spring we do a major eight week long project with the Port of Seattle. Huge connection, they come in and speak to our students and it's all about those careers and those opportunities that they have. Um, our tagline is the sky is not the limit. We get asked all the time, uh, we have guests and say, how, how do you do it? How are your students so successful? Because they're just regular high school students and it's about creating the opportunities with our industry partners and there's just you can't put a value on that um, so i would urge if you're an employer um, get involved in the schools take a chance and know that high school students can do it <coughs> take 20 seconds if you would your students come from afar <coughs> from a far away mm -hmm. they want to be here so can you talk about how far away some of the students are coming just to go to high school here we do we have students as far south as south tacoma um, as far north as up past north shore and edmonds linwood area and as far east as north bend um, and again we have a full lottery system um, so we're not handpicking students um, they, they apply because they want to be here so we have a beautifully diverse school all different um, areas that they are interested in pursuing in the aviation and aerospace industry from business to law to engineering and to um, becoming a pilot uh, and the the key to that success again is those industry partnerships we just can't stress it enough so um, you know anytime I get to tout our school but that it can also be done um, at other schools across the Puget Sound and indeed across the state well, speaking of touting the great students, Max, let's go to you. Uh, talk to us about talk to us about your studies, why you chose this career path, and why you love going to school at Raceback Aviation. Well, that's a great question. Uh, for me, I've always loved aviation for as long as I can remember. Uh, I've been passionate about aircraft, learning about aerodynamics, and earning my private pilot's license, which I did last year. Uh, and as soon as I found out about Raceback Aviation High School, and I think it was the sixth grade. I made it my ultimate goal to continue school uh, there. And for the past three years and almost four now, it's, it's really been a dream come true just because of the hands-on learning and the industry relationships. And speaking of that, uh, my mentor is actually one of the chief flight test pilots at Boeing, which is just awesome. Um, and now I'll talk quickly about a few classes and their emphasis on aviation and STEM. Uh, for example, the, the freshman physical science and physics of flight class involves a lot of hands-on projects that center around teamwork, like building a, a heat shield or a small-scale solar car with your group. Um, and one of the more notable projects is uh, the flight test project, uh, where we use the Flight Sim X-Plane, some of you know that, uh, on our school laptops, and then we run an extensive test program on an aircraft of our choice. So I chose the good old Boeing 777-200, and uh, then we presented our findings to people in the industry. So, you know, it's the professional networking and the awesome STEM projects that make the school really, uh, really an awesome place. Now, Max, I understand you've gone above and beyond to find internships. <laughs> a little birdie has told me that you, like, you have done multiple internships, you're serving on lots of boards and committees. Mm -hmm. talk, about, talk about why and talk about what you're doing in this space. Yeah, well, I'd love to get involved with anything aviation. So uh, I'll talk quickly about um, one internship I had last summer and that was uh, the Blue Angels internship. So, sorry, that would actually be two summers ago. Of course, they didn't come this last. Uh, but, uh, so I was on the flight line working with the Blue Angels team and doing some crowd control, interacting with the pilots. So 
it was awesome. And then uh, I've actually, with the time now that we've been home for COVID, I've actually started a senior project. So I'm working on a wind tunnel in my basement. Um, and so, you know, there's just a lot of cool opportunities that the school provides. And, um, you know, it's, it's my job to, to take advantage of those. So. So, Max, you have no extra free time on your hands, so you build a wind tunnel at home, you've done a Blue Angels internship, you serve on all these committees here at the Museum of Flight and all. Uh, what do you do for fun beyond this? Well, for fun, again, it's got to go back to aviation because that's, <laughs> it's really my life. So I love scale modeling, uh, building scale models, drawing, uh, using flight simulators, and then, of course, uh, using my private pilot's license to fly family members and friends around. So. You know, anything aviation, I love it. So. so look out ahead. Talk to me about what's next. Where, where are you going from here? Yeah, so um, I'm in the search for colleges right now, looking at all sorts of aeronautical engineering programs at University of Washington, of course. Embry-Riddle has got a great program, USC and Purdue. So uh, after that, I'm, I'm looking at aero engineering and maybe even a minor in propulsion or uh, aerody more aerodynamics. So. Uh, then after that, uh, my ultimate career, career goal is to become a Boeing flight test pilot. So again, going back to my mentor at, at Aviation High School, um, he's you know been great at directing me in which way I need to go and what colleges I should look at in the program. So that's what my plan is for the future. You're a busy young man. I think the future in aerospace simply <laughs> looks great with you there, Max. When you start flying planes, call me. I want to come fly on one of your planes. All right, will all do. Right. Thank, Thank you. you all for Thank joining you, us. Thanks, what a great Max. example of one of your students here, Principal. Anything, closing comments? I know we're way over in this segment, but this was so special to spend time uh, with one of your students You know, today. and Max um, really wrapped it up because it's about the opportunities. Um, and I just can't say that word enough. And everything from national um, opportunities like the FAA and TSA, um, having Boeing right here in our back, backyard. I've actually been contacted with, from STEM schools throughout the United States on how to develop relationships um, with that. And it really just transforms students' lives. And sometimes I know when they when businesses hear high school students, they go, oh, you know, they're still young. They are young, but they have got it going on. This generation has passion and talent. Um, and I, I think, like you, like you said, our future's in great hands. I indeed. Well, thank you all for joining us. What a great conversation. Tom, thank you for joining us as well. You know, over the past three years, we've had a chance to visit many of the great shop floors in the aerospace industry. And our good friend, George Riddell, the president of Big House yeah, Media Productions, sure. put together a highlight film. Take a quick look.
Washington, we're fortunate to have a diverse aerospace economy, and that includes a strong commercial aviation sector. Over the past seven months, the commercial airline industry has seen major changes. I had a chance to do an up-close and personal experience at SeaTac International Airport this summer and was totally impressed with extraordinary attention to detail and the safety precautions our airlines are taking. Joining me on set is Diana burkout Racco, AWB board member and the current chair of the Seattle Chamber Board of Directors, who serves as the Vice President for External Relations at Alaska Airlines. Welcome to the set. Thanks, Chris. So tell us about the efforts that you're doing to give safety and confidence, not only to your employees, but the traveling public as well. Because I had a chance to get to see it. I thought it was pretty cool. I know, I'm really excited that you were there. One thing I forgot to give you while we were there, I brought you our new and improved double wall uh, fill before you fly bottle with Mir, local company. So we'll sanitize that and, and hand that over. That's cool, thank your, you. Your girls might try to steal it from you though. Um, so thanks for having me and I'm excited to get uh, my colleague Charu into the conversation. But this has really given us all an opportunity to sort of reevaluate how we do business and think about what do we need to do to make sure that um, health and safety are number one. Safety, as you know, has always been our number one value, and now we just look at personal health as part of our commitment to safety. So there's no silver bullet for COVID-19 absent a vaccine, but what we've done is look at it as a layered approach so that if all of those layers adding up are significantly reducing risk for our guests. So let me talk to you about those layers just briefly. We actually worked with partners and our local experts at the University of Washington uh, to make sure that we were um, doing the right thing from a medical perspective and we've implemented more than 100 actions throughout our system. So we call this next level care. That includes no mask, no travel policy. 99.9% .9 of people are actually adhering to that commitment. We have, however, banned 104 guests who wouldn't comply. Um, and our flight attendants have just been amazing and really helping people understand why that matters for each other. We require a health agreement from each passenger. When you check in, you have to attest to certain things just like we did when we came into the Museum of Flight today. We blocked our middle seats through November 31st. We're gonna keep reevaluating that. Um, and we've extended and enhanced our aircraft cleaning program so that um, high touch point areas and overnight a deep clean on every aircraft so you can feel confident and actually, you know, bring your own wipe, wipe it down. Um, we'll, we'll, I think a lot of people are finding that you've never seen an airplane so clean and that's great. Um, the other things that we think about are the HEPA filters. The air comes through a HEPA filter. It filters out 99.9% .9 of particles and the air in, a, in an aircraft, you probably don't think about it, but it's actually a lot fresher than you know, like this, but not as fresh as sitting in a conference room. The air comes down through the top of the airplane, is pushed out the bottom, and it re renews every two to three minutes. So that's just another layer of safety that we're bringing into sort of greater focus over the course of this, this, um, uh, this period. And the last thing that we'll talk about is touch-free innovation. So how do you, and that's where we're gonna turn it over to Charu, but how do you get through um, the airport touching as few things as possible? The last thing I'll say, just for um, those of you watching at home, is um, keep an eye on some studies coming out of Harvard and the Harvard School of Public Health. Um, they partnered up with a bunch of aviation experts to look at how safe is air travel right now, and they published a study in September on face mask use in air travel, for example, showing that when the use of masks is implemented in combination with these other layers, there's significant protection from acquiring COVID-19 through air travel. So we're encouraged to see that those practices are working. Um, I'm taking my husband to a surprise location on an overnight via airplane for his birthday this weekend. Mm. But just in case he's watching, I won't tell you exactly where, but it's another great Pacific Northwest location. Well. Do you want to bring in your partner here? That's I would be today? glad to, thank you. So um, Charu Jain is a great colleague of mine, uh, Senior Vice President for Innovation at Alaska Airlines. And um, Charu and I have had a chance to work on a number of different things together. But um, one thing that we've realized is that innovation and safety right now are inextricably linked. So Charu, could you talk a little bit about um, how innovation has helped us get to a touchless experience and reducing um, the friction points uh, both tactile and otherwise in Alaska's um, guest journey. Sure, thank you, Diana, and hello, Chris. Uh, very excited to be here and touch on this topic. So like Diana said, with hygiene and safety concerns that are top of mind, we have focused our innovation efforts on making it easy for your travels to be almost entirely touch-free. So we looked across the entire guest journey and looked at every point where you have to touch something like a kiosk where you have to exchange paper or documents or a credit card, and where you have to be in close proximity to another person and are making all 
all of those experiences touch free. So everything starts with the Alaska mobile app. You can check in for your flight and pay for your bags on the mobile app. When you get to the airport, you need a bag tag. So you do not have to touch the kiosk screen at all to get a bag tag. You can scan your mobile boarding pass and it'll print as many bag tags as you need. Next, in case you need to check in with an agent, the agent can now text you your boarding pass and email you your receipts. So no exchange of paper required. And as you're boarding, your boarding pass can now be scanned from up to six feet away. So you can maintain that physical distance between you and the agent, keeping you both safe. And then when you're on the flight, when you order food or beverage, you need, um, you, know, you, you need to have your credit card ready and then exchange it with the flight attendant. Starting November 1st, you will now be able to pre-order your food choice and pay for it with your stored credit card or add a payment card to your account. So when you buy on the flight, the flight attendant can just use your stored uh, payment card and no exchange of credit cards and no reaching out across other guests to make that payment. So these are some of the ways that we're trying to make that experience touch-free. The Alaska mobile app is still the single best uh, tool to limit contact while traveling. So please download it if you haven't done so uh, already. And then beyond this, we're also working continually to make sure that the, your journey is frictionless and your communications are seamless as you travel on Alaska. Char, it's funny you mentioned the Alaska mobile app. I think you might see it here on my phone. What it doesn't Wonderful. tell me is where Diana and her family are heading today. I could, <laughs> I could give her husband a tip if he could, if I could access her account on my phone, which I can't do. But speaking of technology, Diana, you guys have been on the forefront of this throughout your whole journey at Alaska Airlines. Talk about how you're using tech to reach young people as career paths to come to work at Alaska. Well, I'm actually gonna, I'm gonna pitch that to Charu because she's had a great number of people actually come into the, um, uh, Charu was our CIO and ran, uh, IT for a while and has had a lot of people coming into Alaska um, helping us on the innovation team with e-commerce and with technology and actually sits on the board of Year Up who um, has a great mission in terms of involving young people in tech. Charu, do you want to talk about that a little bit? Sure. Uh, so as you can see, I'm sitting here with a background of our airplane maintenance hangar at SeaTac and uh, the maintenance technician jobs they're very, very complex. And they and, and, and we need a lot more of our maintenance technicians. So it can take many, many hours of training to get up to speed. So we partnered with Microsoft on their HoloLens technology uh, to get new entrants into the space and up to speed quickly. So this is one example where with HoloLens, new technicians can use augmented reality to better understand the parts and processes of the job. And, and we heard from Max earlier today and his passion for this industry. So technology like this can help him get into the workforce and get up to speed quickly. And Max, if you're still listening, we'd love to have you intern with Alaska. But on the technology side, we partner with Europe and provide a lot of internships and job opportunities for Europe students so that they can reach their full potential and get the support that they need. And every year, Alaska sponsors Aviation Day where we invite 2000 youth to attend and learn more about exciting careers in aviation and technology. So we're trying to create a pipeline like non-traditional pipelines to be able to hire from uh, for the workforce of the future. Thanks, Charu. It's um, funny, Chris. I think, uh, I won't speak for you. I used to think of myself as young, but I know that my kids are going to do a lot better um, studying to be a pilot or a maintenance technician via machine learning and hollow lens and AI than I necessarily would. So I think that's really exciting. It's uh, certainly a lower barrier way to get people through training and into the, um, into the industry. So speaking of the industry, you know, I think we are going to have a phenomenal growing industry here for Max to join. It's, um, I think we've all noticed some quieter skies. They're starting to pick up. It's great to be in this location surrounded up by all these airplanes. and. Um, Alaska is uh, definitely coming back and we are going to be here for the long term. We're definitely seeing a lot of guests come back. I've taken my family on a number of really great trips. Um, I know you may have um, uh, tested out our services as well. Um, but one of the things that I wanted to just sort of signal and, and ask you to think about Charu is um, as we move forward into this year, this really is going to be our year of becoming an international airline sort of beyond just Canada and Mexico and Costa Rica. 
Uh, we are joining One World, which will offer um, access to uh, over a thousand destinations around the globe th uh, through 13 phenomenal international partners. And technology plays a critical role in making sure that that's a seamless integration and a seamless experience for guests. So it's technology of the kind that you hope you never have to think about because it's all just working perfectly for you. Um, so Charu, can you talk a little bit about how technology plays a role in getting something like that off the ground and in particular One World? Sure, so along with the touch-free work, we're very excited uh, to sort of unlock the potential of this global network in partnership with some very high quality carriers. So we're working to ensure that guests can earn and redeem miles across all of the 22 partners that are in the Alliance and that all the elites are recognized across the entire journey as if they would be on Alaska. So it shouldn't feel any different. And our technology will ensure that you know, you receive a consistent, high quality experience. It'll feel like one connected travel experience, no matter which carrier you're on for which leg of your journey. So just to, just to make this more real, let's take a guest, Kayla, who lives in Seattle and is an MVP Gold 75K. So on a recent trip to Tokyo, Kayla chooses to fly JAL over the competition. And why is that? because she can earn Alaska miles on her trip, and she did. And now that Alaska is part of One World, she also experienced all the benefits that come with One World Emerald status. And when it comes time for her to make a much needed vacation to Barcelona, uh, she chooses to redeem on Iberia and will receive all of the same benefits. So that's what we're striving for, is that consistent experience, no matter which carrier you're on. And with, with One World, the Alaska brand really goes global. And Seattle will become core to One World's global network. And you'll be able to connect from Spokane or Walla Walla to anywhere in the world. So very exciting um, coming ahead. Thanks, Charu. Uh, Chris and I had a chance to take JAL uh, a, a year ago or so um, over to Japan to do a trade mission that AWB organized that was really phenomenal. and. Um, this is a global economy. This is a global hub. We are going to build this economy back. Um, and Chris, I just want to congratulate you and your team for being so flexible and um, you know, innovative oh. yourselves to have the manufacturing bus tour go all <laughs> around in some new ways during the coronavirus pandemic and um, right here to the Museum of Flight. So thanks for having Charu and myself. Yeah, th thanks for being here. I'd say a couple things. We had a great experience flying JAL to Japan. Uh, we are a globally connected community uh, and nothing like Lyft. Uh, to get us there along the way. So thank you both for joining us. And I want to say, it's not every state, it's not every community that gets to say they have a hometown airline. Thanks Alaska for your support and partnership. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Now it's my pleasure to welcome our next guest via Zoom, State Senator Bob Hasagawa. Bob is a lifelong resident of the 11th Legislative District, which he has represented since 2005, first in the House and now in the Senate. He currently serves as the Vice Chair of Financial Institutions, Economic Development, and Trade Committee, among others. Senator, welcome on in. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Great well, backdrop, the by the way. <laughs> well, the Museum of Flight is in my district, so uh, welcome. It is great to be in your district. Great to talk about aerospace and this important sector of our economy. What can we be doing from a state perspective to help build this industry more? You know, I think the best thing that we can do is build the, the ecosystem that supports manufacturing. You know, I mean, one of the biggest issues that Boeing has always complained about it was the transportation system, you know, and, and getting gridlocked uh, with traffic, um, trying to get parts across from Auburn or uh, Fredrickson or wherever they happen to be to where they need to be. And uh, it's, that's been a problem. And, now, building the education system, the um, workforce development system, building that entire ecosystem that supports manufacturing and business here. Um, that's probably the best thing that we can do. Of course, that all costs money. So, um, you know, we're working on a proposal in the uh, legislature to create a publicly owned bank for the state of Washington to increase our capital financing capacity to be able to fund all of these things. Senator, I'd love to get your perspective on this. We recently completed our sixth annual employer survey across the state. And one of the concerns that came out of it was the concer concerns around the 100 to 500% increase in unemployment insurance. Kind of, what are you hearing? What do you think the solutions are going forward? Yeah, you know, 
I've heard that rumor and I've dug into it to try and get to the root of it and see where, if it was actually true. And it turns out it's not anywhere near uh, being true because our uh, unemployment trust fund is very healthy. You know, it's it's hasn't even dropped to the level that it was at during the Great Recession. And we start off at about $4.7 billion in the trust fund going into this COVID uh, economic crisis. Uh, it's down to about $2.3 billion now. Um, but at the height of the recession, it was down to $2 billion. So we're healthier than we were even during the Great Recession. Uh, so I looked at the projections, and they're projecting no need to increase. In fact, the, the forecast council just came out with these projections. No need to increase the um, solvency tax. Uh, obviously, there will be a need to increase the um, social tax and the experience tax because we've got to rebuild the fund again. But it's, you know, they're talking in the terms of one and a half percent or something like that, not the 500 that I've heard rumors. So um, that's good news for everybody, right? Senator, for folks that aren't familiar with your legislative district, can you talk just about how important the manufacturing economy is in your district? Yeah, you know, I have the privilege of representing one of the most diverse districts in the whole country, both uh, culturally and ethnically and also uh, business-wise. So, you know, there's over 150 languages spoken in my district, for instance, uh, which brings a whole interesting set of issues that uh, we need to deal with as a state government. But manufacturing-wise, um, you know, Boeing corporate headquarters used to be in the heart of my district down there at uh, Plant 2 uh, on Boeing Field. Um, United Parcel Service Global Headquarters used to be in my district. The first Costco in the country, uh, in the world, uh, started in my district. Starbucks is headquartered there. So, you know, we've got a lot of uh, good, um, solid infrastructure. We used to have a more solid infrastructure to support business development and the ecosystem and the small business and the suppliers and the supply chain that supports those major anchors. Senator, I want to thank you for joining us and thank you for participating in an ESPN game day like set. You're sporting some college apparel there, I think I see. <laughs> yeah, there, that's what I thought. All right, Senator, uh, appreciate you, you supporting uh, the University of Washington Huskies. Thank you for being with us. Stay safe out there. We look forward to working with you in the next session. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Now it's my pleasure to welcome on to today's show, State Representative Tom Dent of the 13th Legislative District. Representative Dent serves on the Transportation and Other Committees and is joining us via Zoom. Representative Dent, welcome on into today's broadcast. Well, thank you, Chris, good to see you. Good to see you I'm too. Honored to be here. I wish it was in person, Representative Dent, not you know hundreds of miles apart, but let's pick on this theme of, of workforce and education and talk about what can the legislature be doing to, to promote uh, programs like Core Plus and CTE programs? Well, I, um, I'm not hearing you very well, so I must. I think you asked me about Core Plus. I did. So, Correct. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. What can we do about oh. Core Plus programs to support uh, pathways to workforce? Well, you know, I, I think these are excellent programs, and I think it's something we really need to expand on. And uh, I think the one, one of the ways that we can do that is uh, we need to give some incentives incentives for uh, for our business community and manufacturing community to uh, uh, to expand and use these programs to bring uh, to build our workforce and where we want, would like to go I just think it's so important that we do that you know I, I I've watched this uh, higher education thing for you know all my life and I wondered if we haven't been going the wrong way and I believe we have and to, to change direction here a little bit and put our put our young folks into a program that gives them an opportunity to uh, develop a career and, and move forward into the future where they can actually take care of their families and have a life, I think is very, very important. And uh, I think a lot of folks don't think about it in the same way maybe that I do. I'm a pragmatic individual and I believe that uh, setting you up as an individual to take care of and feed your family and have a life, have a house, you know, the things that we all want in life is very, very important. And uh, maybe get a little bit off, uh, don't get so quite so carried away with the level of education because uh, maybe there's other pathways. And I think we've proven there's other pathways. So. Uh, drawing from my own experience and my own family, I can see that that's true. So, 
Representative Dent, let me go on and talk about our, our employer survey that was recently completed, our sixth one during COVID. The number one thing that members and employers in the state of Washington said the state legislature could do is to help lower their cost of doing business. What are your thoughts about B&O tax relief or other relief for employers? Well, it's obvious I think tax relief is an important thing we can do. I think. For, for any kind of a business or occupation, if we want them to grow and expand and uh, do more to put more into our society, then we need to give them some tax relief. If, if we take the taxes and spend it as a state, and that it just takes away from their opportunity to, to uh, expand their businesses and move forward. And this is so, uh, um, you know, b &O taxes is uh, having having paid b &O taxes for 40 plus years. I understand that it can be, if you can get a little tax relief from the b &O tax and reinvest it into your business, they're going to get the money back in the long run. And uh, it's going to uh, just help our entire society and community grow. We've got about 30 seconds left, Representative Depp, but you too are home to a rich manufacturing base. Could you talk about how important manufacturing is in your legislative district? Absolutely, we, we, you know, there's a lot of manufacturing goes on right here, not too far from my house where I'm sitting right now. And it's, uh, it just creates so much uh, opportunity for um, job opportunities, career opportunities. Manufacturing is very, very important. And I think it's a good, solid, clean industry that really does uh, move any community forward. I'm just uh, I, I always concerned if it looks like we're gonna lose something and we have Jeannie here and when Jeannie has to lay folks off because things slow down, it, it hurts the community. So I'm always, uh, uh, I'm very, very supportive of keeping those folks in business and keeping them working. Representative Dent, it's good to see you. We look forward to seeing you next legislative session. Stay safe out there. Okay, thank you. Now it's time to celebrate our PPE heroes, the Washington manufacturers who answered AWB and the governor's call early in this pandemic to manufacture personal protective equipment right here in Washington for Washingtonians by Washingtonians. This equipment is incredibly valuable for our state, whether it's face masks, gowns, hand sanitizers, or any other PPE. I need to thank our friends at US Bank for stepping up to help support this episode, highlighting great companies making PPE our PPE heroes. Now it's my pleasure to welcome to the set our next guest. Stefan Tibbetts is the CEO of Ziva Aero. Ziva stands for Zero Emissions Electrical Vertical Electric, I'm sorry, Vertical Aircraft. His company designs and builds vehicles for true point-to-point -point traffic. I may need that tonight when I need to head back south and I-5 is completely full. Maybe I'll be able to have a chance to get an early access ride. And earlier in the pandemic, Tibbetts led an effort to use 3D printing to make reusable masks for medical workers. This partnership with Fab Lab in Tacoma is just one example of many in our state where manufacturers are stepping up to produce this important PPE product. Welcome to the set. Thanks, Chris. Great to be here. Hey, tell us a little bit about the company. Okay, so Ziva is uh, uh, it was conceived back in 2005 with a, uh, an idea to do electric vertical aircraft. And uh, so we, we basically put the idea on the shelf for a while, but in 2017, we started to develop a personal electric aircraft. So the idea behind it is it takes off vertically, transitions to horizontal flight, and goes about 160 miles an hour uh, with you inside here. Here's your head facing that way. This is a 1-6 scale model. We have a full scale model at our shop right now, which we're flying on Tether. So that's the flight te test. You have a full scale stage. model now. Yes, yes, we do. Can I borrow it at five o'clock? <laughs> I didn't bring it here today. <laughs> you can swing by, if the traffic's bad, swing by Tacoma and check it out. Jump there. into it? Yeah. That's, that's really cool. Uh, what's also really cool is you're kind of answering that call for PPE. We know that's just critically important to our everyday way of life. Tell us about what you started <clears throat> doing, why you started doing it. Well, um, you know, I, one of the founders of Fab Lab, we started the company in 2012. Um, we're a makerspace, so we have access to all kinds of different equipment and tools. And one of the things we have is 3D printers, and and we're creative. So we have, you know, kind of the ability to to think and hack and make something out of something that that 
it wasn't before, right? And so, uh, you know, we heard of, we, we were actually on our way back from California, heard about the pandemic, and, and then we started hearing on the news that our medical professionals didn't have masks. They were running out of face shields. So those are two things that we started to think about. So don't laugh. We started out literally um, proposing that we do this mask, which is actually a snorkel, but we adapted it with this 3D printed piece that has a filter, a HEPA filter from a vacuum cleaner. So it turns out that we did this and we gave a couple of them to the Madigan Medi Medical Center and they, um, they used them for their anesthesiologists who are right down there, um, you know, in, in the zone, danger zone with patients. So we, we actually were visited by a couple of Madigan um, surgeons and they said, well, that's great for that application, but what we really want is the Montana mask. So we started 3D printing the Montana mask at, per their request. And so we obviously we improved it a little bit. We put a nicer seal on it. And then, um, then we were approached by, and we made thousands of these, by the way. We printed literally thousands of these. We also made um, thousands of these face shields <clears throat> for um, medical personnel using our laser cutter. So we use our laser cutter to cut the parts out. And then um, you know we attach the, the face shield to it. In, in some cases, and early on, you couldn't even buy any of this plastic. That's right. These were protection sheets from an office supply store. So again, being creative and coming up with a way to do it. Nowadays, there's still a need for face shields, but we're sourcing them uh, and they're, they're a lot easier to use and a lot easier to put on and take off. So on top of that, we, we wanted to get our cost of the mass down. So we actually are developing a project that is injection molded. And so this, this, like the Montana mask, this will be two and a half times more breathable because of the surface area. And so we're making a tool right now that where we can mass produce these um, out of a very nice material. So that's kind, of, that's kind of how we did it in a nutshell is seeing the need, fulfilling the need. And I think that's where a lot of the maker spaces around the country jumped in and helped out where they could and, and to fill an immediate need. We got about a minute left here, but could you talk about the response from your employees? How did it, how are they feeling about making something that's so much needed, so much on the front line of our first responders? It was it's amazing. Um, we had not only employees, but we had volunteers coming to us saying, "How can we help?" So we would, you know, part of the challenge became how do you bring volunteers in, keep everything clean, social distancing, etc., but at the same time utilizing the volunteers to help us assemble these things. So it's been great. Well, we're out of time, unfortunately, but hats off, you you know, this I think just shows the maker, you, you made the comment, we're in a maker space, you're making a next generation uh, transportation item, you've made multiple next generations PPE, hats off to you and the entire team. Well, thank you. Thank you for being with us. Great to be here. Well, now the big moment has finally arrived. On to today's important award announcement. Many thanks to our friends at UPS, a Seattle started company for sponsoring the 2020 Manufacturing of Excellence Awards. This is the most competitive award we hand out in our man to our manufacturers. And the 2020 awardees saw record people competing for this award. This award recognizes a premier company whose commitment to business excellence has found creative solutions to the challenges that raise or enhance the industry standard as well as the involvement in state and local public policy issues that impact and affect manufacturers. Three amazing companies made the finalist list this year. They are GM Nameplate, Hobart Machine Products, and Vaughan Timbers. So without further ado, and I know you'd all want to know, who is the 2020 Manufacturer of the Year? It's Hobart Machine Products. My name is Rosemary Brester and I'm the president of Hobart Machined Products Incorporated, a small family owned precision machine machining company uh, located in rural King County, a little community called Hobart, Washington. Our company was started in 1974 when we were living in Renton, Washington and we were subcontracting 
from a company called Acro General Machine Works where my husband worked. And there were a lot of defense work at that time back in the 60s. And we ended up buying a couple pieces of equipment, putting them in our garage. And my husband taught me how to machine while he went to work and I was watching our small children at the time. And then in 1974, we moved to Hobart and built a shop behind our home where we've been located for the last 43 years. We actually provide precision machining services contract based for the primes, OEMs and aerospace down to the tier twos and threes or tier one actually for Boeing. Um, we also do work for Siemens Medical. We're actually considered one of their prime contractors and we export globally monthly to our global partners. We also do work for the Defense Department um, through our um, tier one companies like Boeing. We also do space, so we're actually working with a couple of space companies and we've just um, been accepted as a supplier to Blue Origin. So our, our customer base is uh, ever expanding and we're very excited about that. And I think a lot of it has to do with our reputation and just that we have a lot of integrity here and we do uh, value our, each and every one of our customers and the people we do business with. We always think our company thinks like a large business. And I know that there was a vice president at the Boeing company that says, you think like we do. And I thought that was a compliment because I didn't realize that. I thought all businesses thought pretty much the same, but we don't. And so we have, we think like a large business, act like a large business, but we remain small in order to stay flexible and nimble. Um, we're not a company or people that go out and seek um, the limelight in any way. We actually were um, nominated by AWB. And when I went back and did the reflection on what our company has actually accomplished, I was pretty impressed myself. Um, we do a lot of volunteering here. We sit on a lot of uh, nonprofit boards, uh, mainly in education. So education is really um, something that we really feel passionate about and try and donate a, a lot of time and finances to make sure that our students and people that are reskilling have resources that they need. And at, for individuals, I have to um, thank the people that work here at our company to afford me the time away to pursue all of those wonderful things that I can do by giving back. And with that, I just again would like to thank AWB. Um, we've been members for almost 20 years, maybe over 20 years now. And I can't think of a better organization that has um, the respect for all people and also all business and that they're working very hard to make sure that we are successful here in the state of Washington. Indeed, great legacy start in garages. Congratulations to Hobart Machine Products. We're joined now by a great friend at AWB, Rosemary Brester, President and CEO. Rosemary, congratulations. You've been such a longtime advocate and partner for the aerospace community, for AWB and all. Congratulations. Well, Chris, thank you so much. We're just so honored and humbled by this award. I can't even tell you um, it was never something that we had ever pursued, and we um, really appreciate AWB and how they've honored us in this way, and all the people that we work with here, and our supply chain, and of course our customers as well. Hey, Rosemary, for those that aren't familiar with you, tell us a little bit about your company. Well, our company started going on our 43rd year now here in Hobart, Washington. We're what is considered a job shop or contract manufacturer. We produce precision uh, machining and assemblies for aerospace, medical, automotive, electronics, and the space community. Oh my goodness, you must be cold. I, I, I am a tad bit cold here. Hey, t do me a favor. T 
you've been really passionate for this industry. In addition to being a small business, you've been a big champion for it. Can you talk about how proud you are to be a champion for manufacturers like yourself and people who are in the aerospace sector? Well, you know, it's very interesting because early on I had someone um, tell me that I thought like a big company and that I had a world view on things. And it was always never just about us. It was about everyone that was in the industry and who the industry touched. And so I, as I got more involved, it became more apparent that it wasn't just about us. It was about everyone involved in aerospace and in manufacturing. So I got involved and became, actually it was AWB over 20 years ago that recruited me into joining and it was I was a skeptic at first because I thought what could a small company like ours really offer and I found out that sometimes many small companies have a lot to offer they're just overlooked in a lot of ways so to step up that's what I did I joined a number of organizations became very actively involved in committee um, assignments and the more that I did that the more people came to me asking for my advice and my opinion and how we could support each other. And so I proud our, you know, we're very proud of how we've been able to step up and do that. We've got about two minutes left. I'd be, I'd be curious, you've had a chance to engage with policymakers over the years. What would be your advice to our state policymakers as they think about this important industry and knowing that they're coming back into session in January? I've given that a lot of thought because we've all suffered um, through this um, downturn, probably one of the worst that we've ever had. And so for me, I have thought about we've had to change how we budget here, how we spend our finances, and we had to pick and choose what was the most important. I think our legislators need to do that, do that as well. They need to go back and reevaluate the types of dollars that are coming into our state and how they allocate those. So we can't continue to go and look forward as a tax and spend. We really need to take a look and get rid of some of those um, areas that are not beneficial to us. And it could be a real hard cut, but they're going to have to take the choice and make that choice just like we in manufacturing had to do. I mean, I know that you talked to um, Boeing early on and They've had to make some really hard decisions, and we as manufacturers are going to have to make those, and the state is really going to have to step up to the plate and make sure that their choices benefit us to keep us here. I can tell you, Chris, in the last week I've had three other states try and recruit me, and so they're stepping up to the bat because they see what's happening here in our state, and we need to make sure that our manufacturing base is strong, I have a strong supply chain here. I want to make sure that they stay here. And I also want to be able to make sure that Boeing space, the space community like Blue Origin and Systema and some of the other defense contractors, medical device contractors are still viable and are located here. Rosemary, we are out of time, but congratulations, Hobart Machine Products, the AWB 2020 Manufacturer of the Year. Congratulations. Well, it's a family affair you. in your house, so congratulations. Yes, please do. All right, thank you very thank much. Thank you. All right, and thanks to everyone who's joined us today. It's been a great final segment for the AWB 2020 Manufacturing Week live show. We've had an amazing six days crisscrossing the state, telling your story, the story of makers, the story of manufacturers in our state. We learned about some amazing things like smart grid, the future of aerospace. We connected with amazing PPE heroes who are helping to provide PPE to frontline people and everyday citizens. We've seen innovative employers. We've had a chance to discuss policy with state lawmakers and federal lawmakers. We heard some amazing students like Lauren and Katie and Max today and had a rich conversation and dialogue with the women manufacturing leaders and so much more. All of these stories have come together in these six shows because of 10 extraordinary sponsors who stepped up to underwrite this important activity. Our eight person team on the road has been here helping to tell the story of your story, the story of people who build strong communities through strong jobs and great companies. 
So thank you to our sponsors, Primera Blue Cross, AWB's Health Choice Partner, The Boeing Company, Walmart, Avista Corporation, U.S. Bank, UPS, Talking Rain, Puget Sound Energy, Out of the Box Manufacturing, and Alaska Airlines. It has truly been an honor and a privilege to tell these stories. So well done to our AWB team. So this is the part they're all standing by. They don't know what I'm gonna say, uh, but I'm gonna say a couple things. First of all, we've had so much help to help make this come possible. From people loading in and loading out, to people writing great scripts, and usually I follow them and try to be on time, but sometimes not always. Many thanks to gracious hosts because you've opened up your facilities, or really your parking lots, to welcome us in to tell your story. So if the camera's on now, live on our team, I'm gonna have them wave as I talk about them. So Brian Temple, our producer and director. Jennifer, our mixer, who makes this all happen uh, along the way. Thomas, who's in logistics and support and helping me stay organized today. Brian Mickey, who's running the camera. Wait, put your hands in front of the camera, Mickey, wherever you are. I know you're behind me somewhere, capturing the image along the way. Jason, for his leadership to put together this important team that is providing today's event. And speaking of events, we have an amazing event team. Carly and Stacy, who've been our event production people. Carly's on staff today. Paulette, who's playing traffic engineer, probably the hardest job on making this show happen back at the office that so many of you had a chance to work with. Or Andy, our Da Vinci of words, and he did a great job writing scripts every day. I tried to say them the right way along the way. Or Lori back at the office doing digital and social along the way. To George Riddell, who's with us on the front part of this, an EWB board member who's helped us tell the story. Many thanks for your support. Manufacturing is more essential today than it's ever been. It is powering our economy. It's a great wage. It's been awesome to tell the story of employers and makers along the way. Signing off from the Museum of Flight, wrapping up the AWB 2020 Manufacturing Week live session. I'm Chris Johnson on behalf of the entire team at AWB. Be safe and we'll see you next time.